Well, thank you for the music. Thank you for the words. The hymn, it's a lovely hymn. It has a lovely lilting melody. Uh, the words mean a lot. You know, how do his people know? One of the ways these people know is by turning to this book, right, coming amongst these people. And we are reminded, as Mr. Brown told us today, of the great righteousness, the great gift that God has given to us through Jesus Christ. It changes who and what we are, both mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, Mr. Garnett wanted me to mention that one of the announcements, you know, he has all those pages, and it's, uh, uh, I would say something, it's, uh, you know, now that he's retired, maybe he forget certain things, but I don't think that's true. He doesn't seem to ever forget anything he's ever read, but this was about the women's weekend, which very successfully came off, and the women have all uh, touted how much they enjoyed it, and uh, we were talking uh, earlier today about how it's an opportunity, as they, each of us have, to express ourselves, to uh, gain enrichment from what the others do in their walk uh, with God and Christ, so it's really neat to be among each other. Uh, today, Valerie and I are trying to figure out how we uh, signal the PowerPoint slides. Uh, I came over the other day, and with Mr. Hall's help, I can control my computer that's back there from the iPad up here until I get to the front row. And once I walk past the front row, it doesn't work. So anyway, Technological things, anyway, you'd think that we had this figured out, but we haven't quite got it figured out, but we'll see how this goes. But this is part two uh, in a message uh, with respect to living in digital Babylon. And today's part two is to develop the muscles of cultural discernment. And this is one of the ways in which we can survive. Um, and as we go to the next slide, one of the things we saw last time was from the data, and you will see from the bottom edge of the slide, the data says the following. This is taken from Faith for Exiles by Kinnaman and Matlock, Faith for Exiles, the Barna Group, and they did an incredible survey in the United States, 18 to 35 year old. They replicated that study in another study called The Connected Generation, and this study went to 15,000 young people 18 to 35 across the world, 25 countries, nine languages, 15,000 respondents, which is huge for a data search. And the results are almost the same across both the United States and the world. That of children, young people, 18 to 35, who grew up in a church household. Okay, we're not talking about the world at large. We're talking about the churched community, the Christian churched community, okay? That 22% of those people considered themselves ex-Christian. 30% consider themselves nomads. They're lapsed Christians. They identify as Christian with various labels, uh, and they're happy to bear that. 38% are habitually go to church. Habitual churchgoers are defined as once per month. So those of you who don't want to come off, and there's your off the hook. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> they have to have, you know, when you do a survey, there's, there's a data that you're trying to get to specific definitions. What will people agree to? Um, and there's other elements. And then 10%, 10% of 18 to 35-year-olds are identified as resilient disciples. Resilient disciples are defined, as you see there. They attend church regularly. They trust firmly in the authority of the Bible. Number three, similar to what our sermonette was talking about, are committed to Jesus personally and firm that he was crucified, raised from the dead to conquer sin and death. You see, this is a critical, it is a critical element of faith that Jesus Christ is not, was just not a living being. That Jesus Christ was not just God in the flesh. That Jesus Christ was the gift from God to mankind. And through his death and his resurrection, we are connected, if we choose, to permanently reside with God. That will see us through the resurrection. That will grant us eternal life. 1 John, 2, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. This is the promise that he promised from the beginning. That was eternal life. That's what we're here about. We're not here to become, you know, better uh, salesmen, better window washers, you know, better people. We're here to become connected to a God who desires us to live eternally. That is what is on the table. That's what's in it for you. That's what's in it for me. That's why we're talking about it. But 
It's important if we can become resilient because then we express that faith to transform the broader society. They're trying to, re these people who are resilient are a part of this subset. And I would submit to you that many of our people, many of our young people, are very resilient. But I want to talk about how that resiliency is continued, how it's built. In our first installment, we talked about the first element on this page. It was real, intimate worship with the Father and Jesus Christ. That they are real, they are personal to you. They are personal to me. This is how resiliency happens. We view God personally. We bring him with us. He goes with us and we change. You know what I mean? The second element that we need to talk about today is cultural discernment, that we must engage the world around us, the digital world, purposefully. Not by accident, but we need to engage purposefully. The other three elements we're going to talk about in the coming weeks, meaningful relationships, vocational discipleship, and countercultural mission. We were talking to a number of the young adults, trying to use a survey and trying to gain more information. Because how do you develop meaningful relationships? How do you have vocational discipleship? How do you learn together? One of the elements of being a resilient Christian is that you are a part of a robust Christian learning environment across a broad breadth of experiences and topics. So the purpose of all of this is not to condemn digital media. It is to understand what digital media has done to our society, what it is doing to us, how we have absorbed it. None of us are any in any doubt, are we not, that we have absorbed the message of digital media. We live in digital Babylon. We have building blocks, though. These five building blocks of being intimate with God, having cultural discernment, having meaningful relationships across cross-generations, having vocational discipleship and countercultural mission make us resilient, make us connected, make us a part of God's living, breathing plan. If you'll turn over with me to 1 John chapter 1, the first, I'm going to do 1 Peter. Let's do 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Here's a great injunction for our work today, for our discussion about developing cultural discernment. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Prepare your mind for action. The world in which we live in today cannot be passively engaged. It must be purposefully engaged. You need to have tools. You don't go to work. Okay, without your computer. You don't go to work without your screwdriver. You don't go to work without your, your, your uh, window squeegee, right? Bill doesn't show up for work and, and bring his electrical tools. He's a window washer, right? Oh, there's Jonathan back there too. They don't, they don't bring the, they gotta bring the right set of tools. The right set of tools to be a Christian in the digital world in which we live and inhabit are found in the pages of this Bible, are found in the message of Matthew chapter six we heard about today. We have the answers. God has not left us answerless. The answers are the, age, the same answers that have been provided for the ages. Seek a real and personal relationship with God. Do you want to know why Abraham was called the father of the faithful? Because he had a real, personal relationship with God. He called God his God. He practiced what he said. He waited for him to provide Sarah waited to provide for a child. These are the elements. We have the right message, but we must turn on. We must be prepared. We must engage purposefully, or the digital world will roll over us. It will consume us, and we will be conformed to it. It says here, be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace. Mr. Brown was talking about this today. You know what I mean? The issue is we must reside so much on the fact that God gave us his only begotten son. Why is John 3.16 known by the Christian world the way over? Because it is the quintessential summation of the purpose and intent of a loving father and a willing, purposed, engaged, 
Son of God, who knew that his blood would be counted worthy to forgive the sins of mankind and reconcile all mankind to God. This is an incredible formula. And it saves souls and connects them to eternity. This is why we're here. This verse says it. Set our hope fully on that gift that is given to us, that is brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ when you come to understand it and the revelation of Jesus Christ when he shall be what? He shall be here in the moment and twinkling of an eye at the resurrection. So this is what we need to do. We need to gird up our minds. We need to prepare our minds for action. We need to not be, as it says in verse, look at verse 14, be as obedient children, not conforming yourself, being poured into yourself to the former ways and lust and activities of the mind in ignorance, but verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. The digital media world says whatever we feel like doing is okay. That's the message. And God says, not quite so. The soul doesn't do well with self-focus. The soul needs connected to its creator. And God says, I was holy. I want you to act think and breathe a different way, my way. And it takes a lifetime. And the very grace of God, I say, to get there. Now, let's go on. I would comment that I, all the slides and things, uh, material of, of this, Faith for Exiles, and both the connected generation are used with permission. Uh, I bought the subscription so that we have full rights to use the, the slides and the information. Okay. Now, in our complex an anxious world of digital media, we must develop the muscle of cultural discernment. There's a great quote out of the book that says, exercising cultural discernment means taking part in a robust learning community under the authority of the Bible in order to wisely navigate in a, an accelerated, complex culture. Notice this is action-based. This is oriented. It is proactive. Proactive with what we think what we feel, and what we do. Let's go on to the next. So I would submit to you that there are three elements to cultural discernment. One is that we need to not hide under a rock. We need to anchor our lives to the Bible. And we not, we not just engage, we must prepare to engage. Now, for those of us who have the responsibility to teach and communicate at church, and I would say thus everybody, because parents also teach at home, etc. There are four other attendant topics that we need to think about, that we will not talk about in this message, is how do we learn in the digital Babylon world? How is learning an action item? How do we preach, but not only preach? And how do we teach the whole gospel? You see, this book the way of life that we have been espoused and blessed and, and gifted, inherited, is rich. It provides the answers to who and what you are and where we're going. Mankind needs connected to this God who is represented through the wonderful plan that we see laid out in the holy days and the great gift of God himself through Jesus Christ. This is the connection. You can't talk about any one of the holy days if you don't talk about Christ. You can't talk about Christ without talking about the holy days, without talking about the plan, which it talks about what? How life began through God's great love and how life will be brought all the forth through God's great love at the end, right? This is the wholeness of the plan. This is what every, Psalm 107, verse 6, what's it say? God will fill the longing soul with goodness. Man's souls are empty without what is found in this book, without an understanding of a great God of love, the God Father himself, who purposed to connect you and I to him through eternity. Anyway, as we talk about this, let's talk about don't hide under a rock. Oh, you guys like that picture, don't you? I, I kind of like that picture, too. You know... No doubt in life you're going to face doubts, questions. You're going to come in contact with images, ideas, worldviews that are opposite to your families, that are opposite to your church values. And we need to know how we just don't ignore them 
or allow them to roll over us, but how do we engage them? And this point is, let us not hide under a rock. There is a right mindset towards cultural engagement, and that God, I submit to you, will guide you in his time. Turn over with me to John 17. John 17. As we look at John 17, notice Jesus says something very interesting. And this is about us putting our minds right to not just hide under a bushel, but prepare to engage. And look what he says. Don't hide just under a rock. Note, John 17 and verse 15. Jesus is praying on the last night of his life. And he says, Father, verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. This is was Jesus' moment. Jesus could have said, okay, God, why don't you just carve out a place over there on the Arab Emirates Peninsula? I'll tell all my people to go, and you form a great colony. We'll, we'll re-resurrect Israel over there, and we'll just, I'll just send them all there, and they all go there, and then the world will have to engage them, and we'll come up with a different plan. That's not the plan. The way forward is the way you and I live. Notice he says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one, from the way that is conforming, from the digital media that has consumed us. Notice he says here, they are not of the world. Why? Why are they not of the world? Because I've called them. None can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him, John 6, 44. None can come to Christ except God calls them. You and I have been called the way it's been openly, richly. The door's open. We believed, we've been blessed. We what? He says, we are not of the world. Just, he says, as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth, for your word is truth. Brethren, the news is, we're supposed to engage this world. We are not supposed to hide. We are not supposed to just create our own insular world Okay? And all live together, and every once in a while we'll peek out and see if anybody else wants to join us. Jesus says, I'm not taking them out of the world. They're going to stay in the world. They're going to be called from where they were. Look at the very lesson of Pentecost. They were called by this nation and that nation. They were there of the diaspora. And guess what? Then they went home. We had this lovely opportunity one time we were in Israel and we were on the way home. We we're flying back out through Istanbul. So we're in a Tel Aviv, and we're in the airplane. And here's this lovely young lady. And she's, I don't know, she's 19, 20, and she's all dressed in black. And there's her husband, and he has the big hat, you know, and she has a baby in arms. And they had been for the holy days to Israel. And they were going home. In their very strict, conservative garb, they were leaving Tel Aviv, and they were going home to Eastern Europe someplace. They all just didn't go live in Israel. Their diaspora is out there. The message, the way of God is to be out among God's creation. The mindset must be, we are not to hide on the couch under a blanket and wait for God to come. Notice we already read 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Don't be conformed to this world. Prepare your mind to be engaged. Prepare your heart and mind and soul to take action, to explain things to people. Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at Colossians 3 a moment. Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. If you then were raised with Christ, Colossians 3, verse 1, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Notice, seek those things. From that strong. Set your mind on the things above and not on the things of this earth. Our mindset must be towards engagement, not hiding, being accessible, presenting ourselves to God and the people around us. I submit to you that is done through knowing the motivators. The motivators are 1 John 2, chapter 2, verse 16. We must know how this world is coming after us, how the society, the way of living. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, the English Standard Version has a very good translation of this. It says, for, this, 
for all that's in the world. Now, if you're not careful, the King James Version says the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And we think, well, the lust. Well, we think that's just the, this illicit side. But the English Standard Version, I think, renders a good translation of the word for lust. It says the craving for, okay? We all know what craving is, right? Double, triple chocolate chip cookies, right? Craving, you know, a handful of M&Ms, you know? You know, craving. The, the, notice, the craving of the flesh. The flesh has wants, needs, desires. Let's be honest with who we are. God created us to desire, to want, to think. These things are there. We have to put them in order. We have to know how, how much to eat and how much not to eat and when to eat and when not to eat. The flesh. And it says the craving of the eyes. Oh, that red, red Ferrari. It just has my name written all over it. Right? Does it fit a family of four? Don't think so, right? There's a time and place. The pride of life. The pride of, well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty right with God. There's this concept here. This whole verse is, is a lovely sermon or two. The whole, what the, is all the, but these are the triggers. You know what I mean? You know, when a person calls and says, well, you know what I mean? Uh, well, most of the people who uh, love their families buy this policy. Right? Oh, have we all not heard it? You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, they're playing to your ego. Come on, right? We've all heard this. We're not new. But what triggers you? A lot of times we're w w letting those things con go over us and over us, and we see the ad, we see the program, we hear about it, we talk about it, and then first thing you know, we've conformed to that thought and idea. These are the triggers. And thus the antidote is 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The antidote is 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Verse, starting in verse 4, 2 Corinthians 10, it says, For the weapons of our warfare, Paul would say, the techniques, we would put it in today's terminology. Paul lived in a very um, militarized society. Rome was there. And we're talking about the Romans and we're talking about all these, these warriors. And he's, he's, Paul loves this analogy of the warfare and the weather. But today in our parlance, it would be, I need the te techniques, the tips, I need the training, the skills. He says, the skills of our warfare, the skills of our engagement with this world are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is where the metal heats the road. Okay, it's not our feet. It's up here. We got in love with the idea. You know what I mean? Well, it won't hurt to walk across the car lot just one more time. You know what I mean? That red car, you know, we see it and go, come on. You know what I'm saying? It starts up here. It's the mind. It's the mind that controls the heart, the desires, the ambitions. This is where our antidote lies to this world as we not, don't hide, that we begin to pray long or short, meandering or contemplative. We say hello to God. We thank him for a lovely ride to work. We thank him that the car broke down in the driveway and not on the freeway. I have a friend, and every time he goes to go away, something goes wrong at home. So yeah, the, 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 the joke is, well, that's a blessing, right? You get to fix it before you go away. There's nothing worse than having your wife pick up a phone and say, 3,000 miles away, by the way, the hot water heater's out, what do I do? And she says, oh, I called the blah, 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 blah guy. You're going, no, not him. He'll steal us blind. <laughs> right? Think about it. We have to engage God. We have to ask God for the mindset that bears up a way that is living and loving. We have to ask God to be able to limit our social media in the right way. We have to know these motivators. We have to set a bedtime. We have to set rise times. Do you know what the biggest, biggest tip that any psychoanalyst will give you? Go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time. You've got to get out of bed. 
If you're depressed, if you're lonely, he said, I heard this guy, and he was, he was brilliant. He says, I've counseled people for 30 years. He says, the first thing I tell people like, who are totally depressed is I've got to get you on a regular schedule, and it means not going to bed whenever you feel like it and not waiting too late to get up in the morning. Regimen is our friend. A powerful friend so that we just don't hide under a rock. That we just don't let digital media consume us. I'd like to talk a moment about why all of this is so real. Why we need it. Because the world around us has unlimited access. The world you and I have is unlimited access. Right now, this room can tune into BBC. Right now. You can know what's going on in London, Chicago. You can know how many cases of coronavirus were exploded today in a nanosecond. You can tell me the number. Did it go from 12.5? Did it go to 13 in the last 10 minutes? It's an asset and it's a danger. Unlimited access. The next one is there is a range of ideas presented today through the speed of technology, which often are untethered to orthodox ways of perceiving the world. People today at various age groups come in contact with ideas that they would have never come in contact with at their age before today. Many times these ideas, you're not old enough to consume them. You're not old enough to address them. But guess what? That world is here. To us who are parents and grandparents, the world we've got is the one we've got, and we better stop hiding under a our head under a bushel basket, and we've got to be prepared to be engaged because these ideas are around us. These ideas are ungoverned by ethical or philosophical norms, Matlock and Barna say. Today we are on the verge of massive social experiment that we have no idea where the end will go. This is true. Look, today there are email, texts, voicemails. You have gender choices, friends, unfriends, keeping up, missing out. Do you recycle or not? The world is accelerated. It's complex. This is accurate. This book has the capacity to help us slow down our thinking, connect to a real God who's personal, and watch how he changes our desires, our hearts, our mindsets, from what being fearful to being prepared to be engaged because God has right answers for a longing soul. And the answer is through his son, Jesus Christ. It changes the heart. It changes the mind. We are witnesses. And if you young people want to know how we get connected, it's this way. And we may tire after 30, 40, or 50 years of saying the same message. But the message is true. This message of this book is timeless. I heard Jordan Peterson talking on his show the other day. He says, you know what? No matter whether or not you believe this book, everybody in the world today has to engage this book because this book has existed. It has gone beyond empires and cities, and civilizations. You have to engage with the message of the God in this Bible who people believed. This book is something to be reckoned with because all those things are not here, and this book still is. And guess what? So are we because our lives have been changed. We know that we have asked for the forgiveness of sin. We have watched it happen. We need to embrace it. We need to champion it from the hills. This is our message. This is how souls are changed. If you want connected to eternity, it is through this God who so loved the world. Loved. We have to really embrace that concept and understand all that he did, all that Christ did is Boldened in the very concept, the very motive of love. There is not an ounce of get. There is not an ounce of me in that statement. It is all about God's love for you. And that changes how you engage and how you prepare to engage in this accelerated world. Look, I want to talk about coffee. Watch this comment. You know, oh, we need a next slide. I want to show you an example of complexity. 
If I go back 50 years and I ask in a shop if you want a cup of coffee, the answer is with or without milk. If I ask a young person today if you want coffee, the reply is do you want calf or do you want decaf? Do you want one shot, two shots, or three shots? Should it be a cafe latte? Should it be a latte macchiato? Do you want sugar? Do you want syrup? Do you want flavoring? Do you want room for more? Do you want a tall, a grande, or a vente? Do you want it in a cup that's used for recycling? Do you want a sleeve with that? And by the way, should I put a vent stick in it? A cup of coffee has got more steps than we can think of. It's complexity. Folks, we have come to absorb it. We have come to under, uh, uh, just live with it. We're living with it, but there's a trickle-down effect for our children. The trickle-down effect should not be missed on us. As we go on the next slide, it says anxious. The world in love to us today is anxious. Notice, remember what it says in Philippians 4, verse 6. Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication give thanks. I want to talk to you a moment about anxiousness. Anxious about important decisions today. Here's what it says. Okay. This study was first done in Faith for Exiles with 1,500 respondents. This study was repeated in the Connected Generation with 15,000 respondents done in 2018 and 2019, ages 18 to 35, from churched families. Kids who grew up in churched families. Okay? They say 40% of them say, I often feel anxious about important decisions. Number two, I am afraid to fail. 40% say, uncertain about the future. 22% say, insecure in who I am. And get this one. Of the world at large, the community here, 20% feel at least three of the four. Christian community, the Christians, okay, 16% of ages 18 to 35 feel at least three of the four. If we aren't, look, the data says we're anxious. And the antidote is right here in Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It sounds simple. It is. When we see anxiousness, when we see complexity that we do not know what to do with, we need to turn our attention to prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. We turn and we thank God we are alive. We are thank God that we have two feet. We thank God we have a voice. We thank God that we can breathe. We thank God that we live in the richest society at the richest age in all of human history. Is there anybody living in the United States, you and I, who cannot but recall that we live in the richest society of all mankind's time frame? You and I live and breathe richness through what we eat, what we talk about and see, our gadgets and our gadgets that no people in human history, kings and potentates, never had what you and I had. This is thankfulness. And when you turn your heart and your mind to thankfulness, something about anxiousness just floats away because you, quote, go to God. We have to teach our children and our young people the antidote to anxiousness is thankfulness. The antidote to anxiousness is thankfulness. This is the way. Anxiousness has a trickle-down effect. Now, I have the next slide, and I am not going to read the next slide. Okay? I would like you to read the first paragraph of the next slide. Parents, because I do not want in a mixed-aged room to say what's in this slide.
This book cited that. I went and found the source. It was in Pediatric Journal. The sobering fact is that the complexity and the anxiousness of our society has trickled down to our youngest members. You and I have a duty to make sure that in our families, in our homes, in our church environments, and our family at large, that this statistic is not prevalent. That we have the antidote. We have the source of power of prayer and thanksgiving. It changes everything. You and I believe it. We know it. And we must make it so. And those of you who are in education and teaching, you see it. You see it more often than you ever thought. I don't know how some of you go to school and teach. I'm pausing because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, th this statistic, this, this element... It shows the power of what is before us, what has engaged us, what has rolled over us. When the most vulnerable do not have the hope that God wants all mankind to have of life, of not just life physically, but life eventually spiritually. This is how emotive, how engaging, how purposeful our God is, how important our message about not hiding under a rock, about engaging. There's some comments here that there's a number of them on the page. Valerie, you'll have to tap through until you have the whole page. These questions that the authors in Faith for Exiles suggest is that ages 18 to 35 should say, do I understand my relationship as a Christian culture? Am I driven by fear of culture or the world? Notice all of these questions have something common at heart, and that is they are achiever-based. They are not commander-based. We cannot command you to have a positive attitude. We cannot command you to do this. It didn't work. You have to choose you have to choose to believe that God is a God of love. You have to choose to believe he began the world not out of ill motive, but out of love. You have to choose to see that that's the God of the Bible, the God of the future. Thoughts that are prepared, we must analyze and judge God righteous in the end. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. You see, not hiding under the rock is recognizing where we are, recognizing that the antidote and the tool is prayer and connectivity to a real and personal God. And then we can engage these questions, and God will hear us, and he will answer us. We're going to move to the next one. The second item is to anchor ourselves in the Bible. It goes along with preparing to engage. And, but today we're lucky. We have wisdom literature. Proverbs, Lamentations, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. The authors of Faith for Exiles enjoin us as preachers and teachers that we should spend more time in wisdom literature. Because young people, 18 to 35, want wisdom. They want knowledge. And those books are full of good and failure. You know, the Bible is the only unique book in the world that has ever existed that says, guess what? Their heroes did good. And oh, this is just it's a book full of great champions. And look how all these people relied on their God. No, this book contains the forbles, the failures, and the successes of people who called on God. You and I are in great company. Some days we succeed in spades because of God's great wind at our back. And other days, the only thing good we did was make the bed. 
there's a great uh, Navy general, not Navy general, Navy admiral, who gave a dress at uh, Naval Academy a few years ago, and his advice to the graduating class was make your bed every day. Some days it's the only thing that you'll get right. Simple techniques can be true. Look, wisdom literature speaks to the temptations of digital Babylon. We must take a lesson from this. You know, my wife and I have this lovely saying, and we engage in a proverb, Proverbs 22, verse 13 in the morning. You know, it's dark outside, especially in the winter months. And I'll, I'll reach over, roll over and I'll say, I hear a lion outside. I don't think we should walk today. Because <laughs> the proverb says, there's a, the lazy man says, there's a lion in the street. I shall be slain if I go out. You know, it's a simple it's a joke, it's you, but it's true. Look, if you, you know, if you don't go to work, you're not going to get paid. You're not going to, you got to go. You got to get out. You got to, you know, you got to walk. You got to stay exercising. Proverbs 6.20 says, keep the laws of your father's commands and do not forsake the law of your mother. You know, if you go on with me, let's go the next part. Oh, Valerie's got it up there. She's so good at this. Okay. I don't know why I need to fix technology. We got the best one back there. Okay. Daniel chapter 9 is a great account here. I can encourage you, let us not just read for comfort. Let us let just read for guidance. Let us read, read the Bible for achievement. What can be done with people and power of the scriptures, of the experience of the ages. And we can see what they did wrong and see what they did right. And we can apply the prayer of thanksgiving. We can apply God's love. We can say, God, I'm here. I don't feel like being here. I don't know what I'm here for. I don't know why I'm here. But I'm here. So God, guide me. It's okay to say that. It's okay to say, God, I don't get it today. And then watch what he does. Notice Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9 chapter Notice what it was Daniel was doing. In the first year of the reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the number of the years, specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years. Daniel was reading Jeremiah's writings. And he was saying, hmm, oh really? He picked up the books, he picked up the scroll, and he's writing. He's purposefully reading what Jeremiah wrote about the fact that they're in bondage, they're a long ways away over in Babylon from Jerusalem, they're captive, okay? And he says, hmm, Daniel said, Jeremiah said this, okay. So he goes to God, and this whole chapter is a lovely chapter, okay? But notice my point here is that Daniel went to the writings Daniel went to the prophets. Daniel was reading. He was trying to understand where he was living and what would be the end of the way. Notice how it goes down to verse 19. He, Daniel finishes his prayer. He goes to God with this whole thing. And notice this. 19. O oh Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own name's sake. My God, for your city and your people are called by your name. God, Jerusalem is beckoning your people home. When will it happen? Young people, someday this world will come to a precipice and you will have to utter that plea to a great God on high. You will have to say, Lord, please listen. We've read Daniel. We've read the 70 weeks prophecy. We've read Revelation. When will you act, God? Because the cliff is looking pretty close. Will you act? Will you remember your people? Will you remember my father, my grandfather who believed in you? Please use Daniel's passion on that day. But remember where he got it. He read the promises of Jeremiah. You will have to read the promises of Daniel. You will have to read the promises of 1 Thessalonians. And you will have to read the promises of Revelation. 
and God will hear you. And Christ will come again. We're counting on you. You are the leaders for the world tomorrow. Now, what resiliency looks like on this slide, these are the five areas of practice of resilient Christians, the 10%. We're going to go to the next slide because the next slide talks about three elements of cultural discernment that are shown in this area of practice. In this area of practice, notice here that number A, the Bible teaching I receive in my church is relevant to my life. Resilient disciples say this appears 86% of the time. Resilient disciples, this is the top 10%, say in my church I regularly receive wisdom for how to live faithfully in a secular world. That we consistently remind you to pray to God, to open his book, he will guide you. He will fill your soul with goodness. This book, our God has the answer. Number C, in my church, I regularly receive wisdom for how the Bible applies to my life. Digital media does not have to consume you. Our God will help you. Choose your venti coffee. This is why the instruction that we gain at church is so critical. Turn over with me to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Timothy 2, 15. 2 Timothy 2, 15. This is the antidote. This is how to be resilient. This is how to be communicative, how to be connected to a real personal God. Verse 15, 2 Timothy 2. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to read the Bible every once in a while if we're going to know what's in it. And those of us who read it publicly need to be reminded that it needs to connect to real lives in real trauma that are really complex, that are really anxious. And we need to draw. We need to underscore. We need to plead. We need to lovingly control. We need to hold it up and we need to champion it. That this book, this God will see you through. He will change your heart, your mind, your soul and connect you to eternity. Every message, every book. Why do we read the scripture? To connect to a real and personal God. This must be our mandate. This must be our injunction. Now, next slide. And Valerie will press one point at a time. You need to press one more. Okay. I had to turn this sideways because I wanted the graph right. This slide is the taken from Faith for Exiles, 18 to 29-year-olds who grew up in the Christian community. Notice the difference between prodigals, who are pink, nomads, okay, 30%, who identify as Christian but don't come, 44% are habitual churchgoers, that's the yellow line, and this line are resilience. The answer to this question, wisdom for how to live faithfully in a secular world. Notice resilience. People find that from God and the Bible and church at an incredible difference. 70% versus 44%. Next one. Wisdom for living with people who believe differently from me. Notice the di difference begin. Habitual Christians don't see that. 34% only. But resilience, 56% of them identify with that. They say the Bible... The way of God teaches us wisdom for living with people who are different than me. The next slide. Help with living wisely when it comes to sex and sexuality. Notice the difference again. Resilient people who have God as a personal God find and see this more who are connected. The next one. Help with living wisely when it comes to technology. Notice here. We need to talk about why we set a time on how much media we're going to watch. And the next one, the last one. Tools for wising, managing our money. You wouldn't think about it. Look at the difference between habituals versus resilience. 
Now I have to catch up. Robust learning is how this happens. The new culture is here as we talk about this. Look, today we are educated by search engine. We are exposed to attitudes, values, perspectives that many times are antithetic. Anti I knew I, I put the wrong false teeth in today. Okay? Antithetical to Christian formation. Many ideas come from outside Christianity. Look, these are topics that we must be prepared to engage. We have the tyranny of now. This is why it's so important that we anchor our souls in the Bible, that we have a real and personal God, because the tyranny of now is that our personal device feeds our brains. Our brains love instant gratification. Click it, turn it, click it, turn it. How many odd times do we do it? We do it in our kitchen all the time. Oh, what did that word mean? We're reading the Wall Street Journal ad. We turn over to the computer and we ask Mr. Google. Right? We ask Siri, where's Brenda? There she is. She's always, Brenda has this lovely joke. She always says it. She goes, well, just ask Mr. Google. <laughs> but it's true. But I'm saying, is it? We love the instant gratification of it. We must understand it's a trigger. We must understand it's what we conform to if we're not careful. And the next one, look at this. Passing of time. In digital Babylon, it strip mines our human potential by making it absurdly easy to squander our most precious resource, which is time. The Bible says redeem the time. The Bible says go to a God of faith and thank him for time. Mark time. What an incredible thing. The world, we just all do it, right? Oh, I'm just tired. It's been an hour and a half on the freeway. I don't believe it. The four, you know what the 405 is? Four to five hours. I tell that people from out of town, and they laugh, they, or they look, don't look at me crazy. I say, no, just ask Troy. Right? He lives on the west side. Four, four to five means four to five hours, right? You don't know what it means. It can mean four. You can, I know. I, I got a new saying. It's four minutes to five hours. That's what it should mean. Okay. All right. Look, we just can't just pass the time. I'm not saying we don't watch media, but I'm saying we need to purposefully engage and mindset our, set our time for how much we're going to allow it to consume. I know I've gone from preaching to meddling, okay, but I mean, but a prepared, active, engaged mind has got to be, it's because it's going to consume you. I mean, face it, you know, once you've watched the third episode of Downton Abbey, you want to watch all X number of them, right? On a Sunday afternoon, first thing you know, 8 a.m. turns into 8 p.m. I mean, we laugh. You know why we all laugh? Because we've all watched more than one episode in a row. Notice I said one. I laugh because we all have watched more than three or four episodes in a row, right? Maybe we've watched a whole season at a time, right? Look, Filtering reality. How should I live? You know, I, there was a great tip in the Faith for Exiles, and they were talking about, so when you're watching the digital media and you're watching this show with your family, and the show's over, you know what we say in a Christian household? Here's what we do. We say, well, that really was not a very good movie. The plot was really not very good. I shouldn't have watched that so much. And really, you know, I've got to explain to you that really wasn't a very good plot. Da, 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 da. And, we, and we ran all over the movie. And their kids are going like, well, what did we watch it for? They offer another t t tip. I thought the tip was pretty good. It said, look, after the movie, say, you know, you know that, that moment in the movie when they really needed help? How would the authors have changed the presentation? if they had inserted the dad reaching for the Bible or the mother saying, let us pray. Let's talk about how the script would have gone differently. Now, what's that do? That teaches what? That teaches discernment. It teaches critical thinking. We can't just keep saying it's bad. Bad, bad, bad doesn't teach anything. We're the adults, and we've got to change the narrative. We have to set our mindsets to engage and not just preach at. We must be achievers. We must prepare to engage. We must ask the questions of what and how differently so that we can engage in conversation. We're not afraid of the questions because this book answers the question. What I will do with my life. What I will do with my life. 
The message about majoring in the basics is true. Basics that build a good Christian household are prayer, Bible study, repeat. Prayer, Bible study, repeat. Yes, morning, afternoon, morning, afternoon. Five minutes, ten minutes. Somebody, you know, a great friend, his chiropractor friend in Pasadena, he gave me a book recently. He came over to find me wherever I was, and he brings me this little, and he's a, a Jewish fellow, so he brings me this book, and it's a whole book on reading the Bible, and it's this lovely, uh, this lady wrote these sentiments every day. It's like a little paragraph and three scriptures at the bottom. And I thought, well, that was a very nice thing. So we keep it on the kitchen counter. So we're trying to have coffee, get out in the morning. And so, you know, we're now saying, okay, Valerie turns over and reads it. I mean, do I have other study? Yes. But can we at least, I mean, sometimes we don't like what she has to say. We're like, how did she get that out of that? And so then we kind of have a discussion about that. But I'm saying we've got to find the ways to insert, ways to improve, ways to engage. You know what I mean? Does it take, you don't have to pray your whole lunch hour away. But can we at least turn to a scripture? Can we, you know, say, I, I've got to take a moment. No other society in the world can you and I bow our heads at a meal in a restaurant, right? Without fear of retribution. Now, maybe that's not your thing. Maybe you say thank you very much with your eyes straight forward. That's your business. But give thanks to God because you and I have food and spades. This is how we prepare to engage this is how we have a real and personal God. This is how we anchor our lives in the Bible. And now we must prepare to engage. Prepare, preparation leads to faithful engagement. How do we live a deeper and truer narrative about ourselves, about our world, about the nature of our loving God with lives that are flourishing? Daniel did an incredible thing. We're going to skip 1 Samuel. We're going to go to the next one, Valerie, which is... Daniel, I believe. Daniel chapter 2. Remember this. Mr. Garnet went over. And why is he going over Daniel? Great rich book. Because Daniel lives in Babylon. The lessons are rich. The lessons should not bore us at all. Daniel serving in the heart of the belly of Babylon. At the very throne of power of the world's power that rolled over Judea, that rolled over and took them in. You and I have no concept of what it is to go in and take a people and take them hundreds of miles from their home. We cannot see that history. Oh, we can read it in the book. We can try to have empathy for it. We don't know what it's like to walk along in a chain gang and walk for hundreds of miles knowing we'll never go home to Jerusalem. That's where Daniel was. And Daniel and his buds all said, okay, we're here. How do I engage this world? In Daniel chapter 2, remember in this account, Daniel finds out that they're about to kill all the wise men, and it might include them. And for this reason, those, verse 12, chapter 2, for this reason the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. But... I won't say it, okay. Um, so, so the decree goes out. No, skip down to verse 17. And then Daniel went to his house. First of all, Daniel went to the king's guard, right? Arioch, and said, what's going on? He says, hey, the king has just torqued. Nobody will give him the answer to this dream, and he's going to kill everybody, and that means you. He goes, I'll tell you what. Daniel goes into king and says, I need 24 hours. And the God I worship will give you the answer. He doesn't say him. He says, the God I worship will. Do you see already a difference in the way Daniel is prepared to engage? God's so real to him that he says, my God will answer you. Okay, don't do this wicked thing. This will be terrible. So verse 17. So Daniel went to his house, made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their, their Hebrew names, his companions, and they, that they might seek the mercies from God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. God, we're going to die. The king's got a dream, and we need you, and we need you now. Okay? Notice what he says. Verse 18. That's verse 18. Now, we know that dreams revealed. Skip to verse 24. Therefore, Daniel went to Arioch, the king's guard, whom the king had appointed 
to destroy the wise men of Babylon. And he went and said to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. And so Arioch quickly brought, I love this line, Arioch quickly. Arioch said, Guys, go! Open those doors. Can you see it in the movie? You know what I mean? All the doors flying open to the king's chamber, one by one by one. Arioch looks down that line. He tells all those guys, you know, they're the soldiers, and they got the big statues, and they got the big arrows, and they got the big half axes, and they're guarding all those doors. And he looks down, and he says, open. And all those doors open, and he goes, Daniel, come with me. Vroom. Arioch knew this would be disaster for the kingdom to destroy all the wise people. And he's going down through there with haste quickly brought Daniel before the king and said to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. What incredible theater. And notice in verse 30, but as for me, the secret has been revealed to me because I, was more, I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king that you may know the thoughts of your heart. And what's fascinating to me is that Daniel does not allow the king to destroy all the wise people. These were the competition. Daniel could have said, well, okay, now we got to structure this in just the right way, and that group goes away, and we come in. He didn't do it. Daniel is protecting them all through going to God. This is prepared engagement. Daniel thinks it all through. Our message and our home teaching must lead to critical thinking. Well, what happened to that? Last time I looked at the clock, it was 10 minutes up. Okay, all right. How will we apply it? 2 Timothy 3.15. We have to read 2 Timothy 3.15. I have a friend, and his daughter was reminiscing recently to me, and she goes, now she's, she says, you know, not until I moved away and was with that other household did I realize the difference. And she goes, my dad, every day at the end of day, and we were home sitting at the table, he'd say, so what did you learn today? And we'd have to tell him what we learned in science or math and, that, and how are you going to use that, et cetera. She goes, you know, that's a much different conversation than people who say, well, what did you do today? What do you mean, what did I do today? I went down the street, I got on the bus, I got ransacked by the same stupid kids who throw spitballs. What, what answer do we expect? We know what that is. But this dad took the liberty of creating a critical environment who says what? What did you learn today? Forget all the riffraff. What did you learn today that will change how and what you act? That is critical thinking. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Many of us have walked in this way of life all the days of our lives. Since we've been little, we've known the Holy Scriptures, which what? Which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That's the critical thought. The message about message is about majoring in the Bible and what it will do for us. I got one injunction for you. Next slide. One little final thought is that resilient disciples, the 10%, okay, who are not just habitual churchgoers, but who are excelling, who are involved in a God who's deeply, richly personal, okay, who are what? Anchored in the soul, who are having cultural discernment, who are preparing to engage in achieving. They have double the time of digital media in spiritual things. So I'm going to give you permission. Double your spiritual intake on digital media. It puts you in good company. Because here's what happens. 291 hours are spent by habitual Christians in pursuing spiritual content on digital media. But resilience spent 562 hours. Look, the total, 2,000, the total intake of digital media consumption for an age average, age 18 to 35, is 2,767 hours a year. That's not counting schoolwork. 
Digital media consumption amounts to seven hours and 58 minutes, 365 days a year. But the spiritual content is only by habituals down at 291. 2767 versus 291. But resilience take in twice the amount of spiritual content on digital media. So digital media can have a good effect if you double your spiritual intake. Interesting point. Now, next slide shows my screen time. I didn't show you this week's. So that was last week when it was declining. But we have a tool. The people up in Silicon Valley, all of our devices have a tool, and it'll tell us. Maybe we should monitor the tool. Maybe we should say, oh, really? I didn't realize I did. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, you know, that show. No, no, I watch that. Okay. Well, maybe we've got to check ourselves. We've got to prepare to engage in that way. Um, as we look at the next slide, I want to go to the last bullet point. It says, look, exiles, we're going to go two more hits. Look at this. Kinnaman and Matlock make a comment. People who find faithfulness in a strange land, why do we want to find faithfulness in this digital world? Why? What's our purpose? What's our motive? Notice what this purpose and motive is. It's so that they can witness to God and intersect with the world as it is. You see, that's a totally different mindset than just, well, God, I've got to hunker down and I've got to protect my soul and, and, and I, I'm going to, it's just me and, you know, digital media is coming at me. Or do we want to understand how to prepare, how to anchor our souls, how to have a living and personal relationship with God and do what? So that we can intersect with the people that God has in the world who might also benefit from the message. It's a totally different achiever motive, Okay. A totally different one. So we don't, as we go through this, let's not hide under a rock. Let's have mindsets that have limits. Let's anchor our souls to the Bible, which is wisdom literature for engagement. And we must prepare to engage more than just saying no. As they said in the book, cultural discernment about technology is so much more. It is an essential practice of following Jesus in an accelerated, anxiety-producing complexity of digital Babylon. We must have essential, meaningful practices of how we put our minds on God, how we anchor our souls in the Bible, and how we limit our digital media, and how we use it effectively to engage the world that God wants to show his love to.